Well, hello, kinesiology students. It's Mr. Crente here, and today we're talking about the motor unit. Now, before we get into how the motor unit works, we need to talk about some in-depth skeletal muscle tissue anatomy. We've talked about what we call gross anatomy. So these are your biceps break guy. These are your triceps. But if we dig down into skeletal muscle tissue, uh, it will show us different aspects of anatomy, a deeper type of anatomy. So here is the muscle belly. So the muscle belly is that part that we think of as the muscle itself. So let's say uh, we're talking about your triceps. Uh, your muscle belly, let's say you have a five centimeter diameter muscle belly, 50 millimeters. That would be the entire thing would be your muscle belly. Now, if I was to take a biopsy of your muscle belly and look deeper inside, so I took a slice of it and I looked deeper inside, what we would see under a microscope is that we would see a number of muscle fiber bundles. So we would see a number of these bundles stacked on top of each other that are making up your muscle belly. Each of these muscle fiber bundles is about half a millimeter in diameter. So all of these muscle fiber bundles stacked on top of each other, around each other, make up your muscle belly. Now within your muscle fiber bundles, you have muscle fibers. And these are your muscle cells. Your muscle fibers are all packed into these muscle fiber bundles, and they are each about a tenth of a millimeter in diameter. So here's your muscle fiber here. And that's the level that we are talking about today is the muscle fiber level. Now within your muscle fibers, you have smaller contractile units still called your myofibrils, but we'll look at those later. So we're focusing in right now on all of the muscle fibers in your muscle. Some muscles have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of muscle fibers, and some of them have as little as you know, a, a, a few dozen muscle fibers in them. So there's a broad range. But that's where we need to start by looking at in the motor unit. So let's look at the motor unit here. Here's our muscle and we're at the level of our muscle fibers. Okay, so here's all of my muscle fibers. Obviously, I'm not going to draw all the, all, the, all the muscle fibers involved, but here's a representation. So we have the muscle fiber. We also know that we have a number of motor nerves making up our motor nervous system, innervating or connecting to these different muscle fibers. Okay? So I don't have one nerve connected to a muscle and the whole muscle contracts or doesn't contract. I have a motor nerve connected to a number of muscle fibers, as you can see here. So I've got this motor nerve here, uh, uh, connecting to this muscle fiber and this muscle fiber and this muscle fiber and this muscle fiber, right? So these elements here make up one motor unit, okay? That's one motor unit. Here's another motor nerve and it's connecting to these muscle fibers, one, two, three, and four, and those are a separate motor unit, okay? The, the, the one motor nerve connecting to a number of different fibers is one motor unit. And you have many of these in your muscles. You have larger motor units and smaller motor units. We'll talk about that, but that is a motor unit. So when the signal from the central nervous system comes through and says contract, it will contract those muscle fibers, not all of them, but just the ones that they're connected to. If the central nervous system wants more muscle fibers contracted, it will send a signal to contract to this motor nerve and this motor nerve, and then they will all contract. And that's multiplied many times within your muscles. So a motor unit is one motor nerve connected to many fibers. OK, 
Okay. Now, how this functions is something called the all or none principle. The all or none principle of muscle contraction says if a motor nerve signal, and we call that an action potential, an action potential is uh, really the electrical charge that the central nervous system has produced and sent through our peripheral nervous system out to our motor nervous system. And that's the signal. It's, it's an electrical signal essentially that is sent and it's called an action potential. If a motor nerve signal, if an action potential is large enough, all muscle fibers attached to the motor nerve will contract. So if I have a large enough signal from my central nervous system, about 70 millivolts, sending down through the uh, motor nerves, it will contract all the fibers in the motor unit. Okay, all those fibers will contract. If the signal is not large enough, guess what? They won't contract. And that's it. You either contract all of the fibers in the motor unit or you don't. So when we think, oh, uh, if I was to, you know, pick something up uh, very gently, like I'm, I'm picking up a, a baby, or if I'm throwing as hard as I can a medicine ball up in the air, those two actions utilize the same muscles. But obviously, my the number of muscle fibers that I use for each of those actions is very different. And that's because of the all or none principle. It's not like I, I can only like throw it up like that or nothing. It depends on the number of muscle, uh, of the number of motor units we recruit. So you either contract motor units or you don't contract motor units. It's all or nothing. You think about it like a couple of things. You can think about it like a gun. If I'm going to fire a gun, I don't have one uh, with me, but if I had a gun and I pulled the trigger on the gun, that gun will either go off because I've pulled the trigger hard enough or the gun won't go off because I haven't pulled the trigger hard enough. It's not like if I pull the trigger very slowly, the bullet comes out very slowly. If I pull it really fast, the bullet comes out really fast. It's all or nothing. Same thing with a mouse trap. I do have a mouse trap here in my home. And so uh, here's my mouse trap. It's already set. And you know how a mouse trap works. If I tap on the uh, on the part where we put the, the cheese or the peanut butter, um, if the mouse comes along and, and puts a little bit of pressure on it, not a not a big magnitude, nothing will happen. But if you put a big enough uh, magnitude, if there's a big enough signal, sent uh, to this area, it has to contract, it will snap, it's all or nothing, right? That's the all or none principle. So my motor unit is the same. It will either contract or not contract. My, my brain sends a large enough signal to say contract or not contract. And that, that's how your muscle contractions happen. Now we have different motor unit sizes, okay? So you might think, well, sir, how come then I have, you know, these, these large movements and then with the same muscles, I have these very gentle movements. You're saying it's all or nothing. We're going to get into some of the nitty gritty here. First, your motor unit size. We have different sizes of motor units. Some motor units connect to hundreds of fibers. Okay, so I've got one motor nerve and it would contract to, uh, uh, let's say 300, 400 fibers all at once. So when that signal comes, whoa, that's a lot of fibers contracting at once. I can get, you know, all, the, all that strength all at once. Small motor units have about 10, could have as few as 10 fibers per nerve. So if that signal comes down, that's not a lot of fibers contracting. So it's a, it's, a, it's a much more precise movement. It's a much uh, less strong movement. I have muscles in my uh, body that have large motor unit. Large motor unit muscles would be things like my quadriceps. So my quadriceps, the, the four muscles of my quadriceps, 
they have a lot of strength because they've got one nerve sending out to you know hundreds of fibers. So when I go to kick a ball, I'm contracting all of those at once, and there's there's one nerve contracting hundreds of fibers, and I get a large amount of strength right out of that that one message, that one signal to many different fibers. I also have muscles in my body that have very small motor units. So if you think of like your, your wrist flexors, you've got a number of small um, muscles in your, in, your, in your wrist, in your forearm area, and they control the fingers. Well, those are very small motor units. You've got one motor nerve connecting to, you know, 10 or 20 fibers. And so they're not going to have as much strength but it allows for a lot of precision. So if I only have 10 uh, fibers contracting at once and I have many fibers, I've got many motor nerves giving me a lot of different signals to be able to contract at a certain time. Think about it this way. If I had 10 people in a room and I'm the central nervous system and I say clap, and all 10 people clap at the same time, I can get a pretty precise movement out of 10 people if we practice enough. Now, let's say I had 200 people in a room and I told them, clap. I had 200 people clapping at the same time. What am I going to get? Probably less precision. They're not all going to clap at the same time, but I'm going to get a loud clap out of 200 people. And that's the, that's the difference with your motor units. A small motor unit can be very precise, but a large motor unit can give you a lot of strength, okay? So that's the difference in uh, the motor unit size. Large motor units give you more strength and smaller motor units give you more precision. Now we still, sorry, we still need to answer the question, how do we control our muscle movements? Okay, so, you know, maybe my bicep is kind of middle of the road. It's not as big as my quads. It's not as small as my, my, my many wrist flexors there. So what's, what's, what's going on here? I can, I can put in a lot of strength or I can do very gentle movements. Within each muscle, you have a number of motor units, okay? So you have a number of motor units within each muscle. And if I want more strength, then my brain is going to send more action potentials to more motor units. So it will recruit this motor unit and this motor unit and you know 50 more motor units. And if I want more strength, it will send action potentials to all those motor units and that contraction will happen and I have a lot of motor units, a lot of fibers contracting at once, I will have more strength. If I want more precision, gentle movement, then I'm gonna have action potentials to fewer motor units. So I'm gonna just gonna recruit this motor unit right here, and that's just a, a, a less strong but more precise muscle contraction occurring. And that's what's happening in your body to be able to create the, the level, the strength of movements that you need to do all your actions with. Your, your brain is, is calculating how, how many motor units do we need to recruit in order to perform this action. Because remember, it's the all or none principle. It's not like your brain says a signal, like a, a small signal, so you have a small contraction or a big signal, so there's a big contraction, it either contracts or it doesn't contract. If I want a strong movement, I recruit many motor units. If I want not a strong movement, then I recruit fewer motor units. And that leads us to a couple finishing topics here, especially for you athletes and we're looking at intramuscular coordination and intermuscular coordination. 
So how do I perform all those skills if I'm shooting a basketball or I'm, I'm doing a, a backflip or whatever the case may be? How does my um, central nervous system um, tell the different motor units what to do and at what time? You've got two things that uh, help you do all the actions that you are going to do. One is called intramuscular coordination. When you think of intramuscular coordination, you got to think within the muscle. So it's the ability to recruit more motor units within a muscle. So within a muscle, I can recruit more motor units if I train a lot or if I don't train a lot, I don't have the ability to recruit all the, the motor units um, that I have the potential to recruit. So uh, with better intramuscular coordination, I can recruit, I can, I can be more strong because I can recruit more motor units within the muscle. An Olympic weightlifter can recruit about 85% of their motor units. Uh, and that leads to them being able to lift all the weight that they're able to. Now, you might think, well, how come they can't, what do you mean, aren't they recruiting all the muscle units they possibly can? We don't quite do that with our voluntary movements. Um, if you can imagine somebody has, um, you know, a tonic-clonic kind of contraction, um, you, you, they, they, it's an almost impossible to, to get them to not contract. That's like recruiting all your motor units, and that's not a good place to be because then uh, your body finds it very hard to relax them. But an Olympic weightlifter will, lift, uh, will use about 85% of their motor units. The average person will recruit about 60% of their motor units. So they won't recruit nearly as many. Um, they don't have the ability to, they haven't trained their brain uh, and their motor units to activate that many at a given time. So because of their low intramuscular coordination, um, the average person has less strength. So, that's that's intramuscular coordination and to help me remember that i think of intramural sports so those are sports within your school right intramural so intramuscular coordination is the ability to recruit motor units within your muscle intermuscular coordination is the ability to recruit motor units of different muscles at just the right time so if i'm going to do uh, an activity like a power lift or something, not only do I want all the intramuscular coordination I can get, I also want all the intermuscular coordination. So I know exactly when to lift with my legs, when to use my trapezius, when to use my biceps. I know exactly the right time to recruit those different uh, motor units in my different muscles, right? I've got an agonist antagonist pair for each of those and I know exactly which muscle to recruit at just the right time to be able to perform that skill. And the better you are at a certain skill, the better your intermuscular coordination is. I know when to contract my triceps and then my wrist flexors and then the fingers in order to throw properly, right? That's and if you watch somebody who has good intermuscular coordination, they look very smooth in what they do because they're they know exactly when to recruit the, the right motor units in the different muscles in their arm at just the right time. So that's intermuscular coordination. It's recruiting those different motor units of different muscles at the right time to do the activity that you want to do. So that's your motor unit. You know, you can think uh, how amazing it is that all of these uh, functions are happening in all your movements every single day, uh, very precise and very strong. Thanks.